We've all seen those isobar charts showing lines of equal pressure on the Earth's surface. But what information can we even gain from looking at these things? And how do the air masses of the world bring with them predictable weather when they approach our location? Let's find out. Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to class 14 in the Meteorology series. Today we're going to be taking a look at pressure systems and air masses. We're going to start off by analysing some pressure systems and look at the typical weather that comes with certain patterns on the isobar chart. And then we're going to be doing the same thing with air masses. We're going to take a look at some typical air masses from around the world and then talk about the associated weather that moves with them. Isobar charts show lines of equal pressure at mean sea level, either measured directly at mean sea level or calculated using uh, temperature lapse rates and taking into account any temperature variations. Usually these lines are spaced two or four hectopascals apart and the best way to think of them is like terrain on a map. Where the lines are close together you would have a steeper hill or in this case you would have a faster change in pressure. We get various different patterns emerging in isobar charts such as lows or depressions or sometimes called cyclones. We get highs which are known as anticyclones and we get other features such as troughs, ridges and calls and now we're going to have a look at some of them in more detail. Depressions or lows are a region of low pressure in roughly a round shape like a bowl. The lowest pressure is right in the middle and the concentric isobars show a gradual or a quick increase in pressure as we move out from the center and the steeper the isobars are the closer they are together then we would describe that as being a deeper depression so it'd be a deep bowl if it had really um, steep sides same sort of thing happening when describing a low and the size of these depressions can be a few feet across can be tiny or they can be all the way up to thousands of miles so that's what a depression looks like, but what does it actually do? So we know that pressure will try to correct itself from high to low. So air will flow into the center of the low, but the Coriolis force will pull it round to the right in the northern hemisphere. And we basically have wind flowing around in an anti-clockwise direction. So it flows in and turns anti-clockwise. And the deeper the depression, the stronger the wind would be. So you get it flowing in, and turning like this, almost like a pinching motion. Close to the surface, this means that we get a general motion of air towards the center, and the air converges right in the middle at the low pressure area. This low pressure area allows this air to rise, and it's also forced up by more air coming in um, and pushing it up behind it. This rising air leads to unstable conditions and cumuliform clouds such as cumulonimbus. And in extreme conditions, with warm, moisture-filled air, um, as it comes in, the spinning motion and the clouds and all the rising air can form a tropical revolving storm, which is a hurricane or a cyclone, which is why these are called cyclones. At higher levels, the air dissipates outwards and the levels of stability start to increase as the temperature cools down. So this means that you have a general motion of air where it's coming in at the bottom, getting pulled up, causing all the cumulus clouds, and then spreading out at the top, which is why you get um, that sort of spiral-shaped cloud forming above a hurricane. So anticyclones are opposite to depressions. They are areas of relatively high pressure when compared to the surroundings. And just like in the case with lows, these highs are generally round but the isobars tend to be a bit further apart, which leads to some lighter winds. And that because of there's a, a lesser pressure gradient force. Anticyclones can be very large in size, and there are some predictable ones uh, formed by something known as the Hadley cells. So in the equatorial regions, it gets very warm, and this causes the air to rise because heat rises. This area of low pressure sucks in air from either side of the equator, which then gets pulled up and spreads out at higher levels. And then once it's cooled enough, because it moves away from the equator and cools down, 
it descends down to the earth and all this descending air causes areas of high pressure and uh, these regions are what's known as the tropics it's where you get high temperatures if we think about tropical conditions it's always quite nice blue skies high pressure areas so what does an anticyclone actually do though well first of all the wind as we said will most likely to be light because of the far apart isobars and it will flow from high to low and then get pulled round to the right by the Coriolis force in the northern hemisphere so wind flows clockwise around an anticyclone which is a bit confusing anticyclone you'd expect it to be anticlockwise but no anticyclone is clockwise so at the surface we have air diverging away because it's flowing from high to low so it's spreading out at the bottom and at the higher levels it's getting sucked in and descending down so i like to think of it as like a, a drain in a sink or a bath or something like that but instead of water getting sucked in it's the air getting sucked in and it's getting pulled down and then spreads out at the surface this descending air restricts any air rising so you can associate a high pressure area with uh, very stratiform clouds very flat clouds or no clouds at all because it's harder for the air to rise and form clouds so if we look back at our hadley cells the highs caused by our hadley cells in these two regions here um, we can see that the areas of high pressure form around sort of desert and dry areas in general and this is the reason why these are deserts or dry areas in general because the descending air the high pressure area isn't letting any clouds form which isn't letting any rainfall which leads it to be dry so that's why you've got the big sahara desert in africa because it's just at that perfect location where it's usually high pressure and uh, the surface of the earth becomes baked as a result so troughs ridges and calls are sort of lesser features on an isobar chart but still have fairly predictable weather so a trough is like a valley of low pressure and therefore produces weather associated with a low depression but in a line sort of following the general valley of low pressure so you would get your cumuliform clouds which leads to you know showery conditions big raindrops and um, yeah sort of bursts of rain a ridge is the opposite but with and instead of low pressure it's high pressure so you get um, a sort of valley again protruding out from an anticyclone and causes similar conditions clear skies or uh, stratiform clouds along the line and a call is a very high pressure area lacking in any significant pressure so your call will be right in the middle here this leads to sort of very still conditions and the pressure has a very low impact on any weather that might form so therefore the surface heating effects kind of take over and lead to things such as morning fog um, or clear skies to form. So pressure has an influence over the weather, but depending on the temperature and humidity of the air, it will form slightly different conditions. If we had a very dry mass of air in an anticyclone, then we can make a fair bet that it will be clear skies and hot. If we have a very humid, uh, massive warm air in an anticyclone, then we'll have more moisture to form stratiform clouds, which will provide a bit of shade and it'll be a little bit cooler. So the properties of the air mass that the pressure is over has a big influence on what sort of weather forms. These air masses can form in quite predictable patterns, such as the low pressure area associated with the equatorial regions that we saw caused by the hot rising air and the associated um, high pressure region of the tropical zones caused by those Hadley cells. You also get a fairly predictable high pressure area in the Arctic polar regions because it's cold, it's pulling everything down, um, it's compressing all the air with it. So these pressure and air masses can then be moved to different regions by changes in the pressure distribution and we classify them based on their starting location, which gives you a rough temperature indication. And we also classify them by the surface type. So if it's over the sea, it's gonna be humid. And if it's over the land, it's gonna be a bit drier. 
the locations we have are equatorial, tropical, polar, and arctic. Arctic slash Antarctic if you're in the southern hemisphere. And Arctic, kind of confusingly, is closer to the poles than polar air. Um, you'd think it'd be the other way around, but Arctic, polar is just cold. Arctic would be very, very cold. And then, as you say, we've got maritime and continental. So the air masses that affect and bring air with them will be a combination of these. So if we had, I don't know, maritime tropical, we'd expect warm air, and we'd also expect it to be very humid. Whereas if we had uh, continental tropical, we'd expect it to be warm air if it's moving towards Europe, for example, but it would be uh, drier because it's come over the continent rather than over the sea. So I live and fly in Europe, so I'm going to give you a breakdown of some of the air masses that affect me and affect Europe. It should give you a good idea of how the air masses work, but different air masses will be more relevant for you uh, depending on where you live. Obviously, equatorial winds aren't really going to affect in Europe because it's so far away, but if you live in the equator, it's going to be a hell of a lot more relevant. So they tend to follow some basic rules though, such as when an air mass moves to a lower latitude, closer to the equator, it will heat up because the equatorial regions are warmer. And this leads to uh, lower levels of stability and increase in instability because warmer air um, is associated with rising conditions, instability. So as it does this, as it moves towards the equator, it, this air mass, this fictional air mass that we're talking about just now, the amount of water vapor that it can hold, the saturation water vapor pressure will rise because they're directly proportional. This means that the relative humidity will decrease because the amount of water that's in the air is fixed, but the amount of water the air can hold starts to rise. So the ratio of the two, the relative humidity, will decrease as a result. The process would be reversed if we move uh, from the equator up towards the north or towards the south. As we increase our latitude, means that an air mass will cool down, it'll increase in stability, and the relative humidity will increase as that saturation water vapor pressure reduces. So that's some general rules. Now let's look at some specifics and you'll see some of these rules uh, come into play. So the first we've got is a tropical maritime uh, mass of air moving in towards Europe. So this would be warm, wet air, and it moves north towards Europe, which means it cools down, which means it becomes more stable. The high moisture levels in the air mean that we start with a high relative humidity, which will then increase as the air mass moves north because the saturation water vapor pressure is reducing as it moves north. And this means that it's likely to form uh, low stratiform clouds, drizzle, fog, uh, stable conditions in general. If we look at tropical continental, it would be warm, dry air moving north and cooling down, becoming more stable as it, got, as it does this. The air is low in moisture, so the rising relative humidity caused by the reducing saturation water vapor pressure will very rarely get over 100% and therefore clouds are quite unlikely to form. This air mass is associated with clear skies, high temperatures, although visibility can be reduced as maybe sand from the Sahara Desert travels with the air and is held near the surface by that high stability. It doesn't have a chance to rise and dissipate. So polar or Arctic maritime air would be very cold or cold air moving south and it heats up becoming more unstable as it does so. It's maritime air, so it means it has a lot of moisture in it and the relative humidity will decrease of the air mass overall as it warms up but the unstable nature of the air causes an uplift of air and the formation of cumuliform clouds um, with showers associated with that. But you would get quite good visibility as all this air is rising up and moving out of the way. So polar or Arctic continental air is usually associated by moving in from Russia in the east. Um, and it has two different effects depending on if it's summer or winter. So if it's in the summer, this air mass um, this air has moved over a large amount of land, means that it's actually quite warm 
and dry, so it has a similar effect to tropical continental air moving in. It's associated with clear skies, um, but low visibility levels. The air mass will travel slightly south, um, which means that the stability will um, reduce slightly as well and decrease the relative humidity, but the lack of moisture in the air will lead to little or no clouds forming at all. In the winter though, it's a different story because Russia is very, very cold, mainly due to its large land mass cooling down way more significantly than areas with oceans or seas nearby. The cold air is dry, and as it travels south, it will become a bit less stable, and the relative humidity will increase, but the lack of moisture levels, again, leads to low or no clouds at all. We therefore get clear skies and uh, very cold temperatures as a result. As I said before, equatorial air masses don't really affect Europe, seeing as we're so far from the equator, but the basic principles of warming and cooling as we travel to and away from the equator would apply to any of these air masses as well. Okay, in summary then, you've got a low or a depression. The wind travels anti-clockwise around it and the air converges in the middle and then rises up, which leads to instability, cumuliform clouds, showers, etc. And in extreme cases can lead to hurricanes or cyclones forming. The opposite to this is an anticyclone. This is your, your drain in the sink or the bath. The air comes in from the top and it descends down and it rotates clockwise around this. Because of the, all the air descending, it means that there's not going to be very high clouds. It's going to be stratiform clouds or um, no clouds at all, really. Some of your lesser features on an isobar chart would be a trough, a ridge and a call. Troughs are low, le uh, low pressure areas that extend out and associated with cumulus clouds, showers, typical depression weather. Ridges are the same, but with high pressure. So they're associated with stratiform, clear skies, stable conditions. And a call is an area kind of in between all these um, uh, regions of pressure, all these significant weather, uh, significant pressure patterns. And it's where there's not really that much change in pressure at all and it leads to the surface heating effect becoming a lot more prevalent. And you can associate this with fog, early morning fog, and during the day, clear skies. You've got various different air masses. You've got the source in terms of location, and then what surface they're over. And all the air masses will be a combination of these things. So for instance, you get tropical and mar uh, continental you get a tropical continental air mass. And sometimes you get a little uh, warm uh, marker after it um, or a cold marker after it. So tropical continental warm, for instance, or you would have Arctic continental cold with a little C. And that's kind of for that Russia case because in the summer it's quite hot and in the winter it's quite cold. So you have a little uh, designator to show which one you're actually talking about. So all these air masses will follow basic principles. As you move away from the equator, things start to cool down, which means we stabilize. This lowers the saturation water vapor pressure and it will increase the relative humidity as a result. And as we move towards the equator, the air starts to warm up, which makes it more unstable. This will increase the saturation water vapor pressure which causes a decrease in relative humidity. So look at the air mass, you can decide if it's cold and wet or cold and hot, and then you look at the direction it's moving and you can make predictions based on these predictable effects.